In this chapter we return once again to the idea of interpolation, but with a lot more detail. The setup is that we are given nodes indexed from t0 to tn, and data values y0 to yn at the nodes. The goal is to find a function p such that p at tk equals yk for all k. That's our interpolation problem. The approach we took before was to choose a polynomial of degree n or less to interpolate the data. But these can have very large oscillations between the nodes unless we choose those nodes very specially. So we're going to look for alternatives. The strategy we're going to take is known as piecewise interpolation. And the two most popular methods are piecewise linear, where the function is linear in between the nodes, and piecewise cubic, where the function is cubic on each piece, the best known type being known as the cubic spline. Here I'm going to give you just a taste of doing interpolation in MATLAB. So I select n here. There are n plus 1 nodes total. And I start out by making those equally spaced. But then all except the endpoints, I'm just going to move around a little bit randomly to make it more interesting. Then I'll define the data values as the values of this fairly simple, smooth function. And here we can take a look at the data to this interpolation problem. So the function for doing interpolation in MATLAB is called interp1, and it takes at least three arguments. So the first two arguments define the nodes and the data. The third argument is the values of x that you want to evaluate the interpolant at. So if we do that, the default choice is a piecewise linear interpolant. So it just connects the dots. As you can see, one of the features of this is that you get these corners uh, every time there's a, there's a node. And that may be a problem for you, especially if you want to differentiate it. So there are many other alternative methods. One of those uh, that's best known is called the cubic spline, and interp1 can give us that as well. So here you see the spline interpolant of the same data, and it is much smoother, although it also does things like create these local maxima or minima that weren't really there in the data themselves. That's kind of the price you pay for the smoothness. Let's now consider the conditioning of the interpolation problem. Let this squiggly capital I stand for the interpolation operator. For a given set of nodes, I maps a data vector to its interpolating function. Most interpolation methods are linear, and ours will not be any exception which means they satisfy these two simple rules. Finally, let's use kappa of y to designate the condition number using absolute measurement of errors, not relative, of the squiggly i operator at the data vector y. For linear methods, we have a theorem, which I present here. You can find the proof of this theorem in the book, but here I'm just going to try to explain what it means. As usual, EK is a column of the identity matrix.
the interpolant of EK is called a cardinal interpolant. It has a value of 1 at node k and a value of 0 at all the other nodes. What appears in the theorem are the norms of the cardinal functions, where norm is the max norm over the interval from t0 to tn. If one of these cardinal function norms is greater than 1, then it measures the amount that the interpolant overshoots the data when it tries to go from 0 to 1. The condition number theorem says that kappa is between the largest of these cardinal function norms and the sum of all of them, regardless of the data. Both kappa and the bounds that are in the theorem depend on the nodes and on the type of interpolating function that's selected. This is one of the main things that distinguishes different interpolation methods. Let's look into a little bit the conditioning of the two piecewise interpolation methods that I saw that I showed in the earlier video. So again, I'm going to do 18 nodes from minus 1 to 1, and they're perturbed a little bit so that they're not just equally spaced. And now I'm going to choose cardinal data. So it's zeros everywhere with a single 1, right? So that represents a column of an identity matrix. And so the plot of that data is very boring. All the values are 0 except for one of them. Now I'm going to do the linear interpolant of that data using interp1. And we'll encounter this again in the next section. Sometimes this is called a tent function or a hat function. It's very simple. And as you can see, and reason would tell you, the values are always going to be between 0 and 1, which means that our condition number bound from the theorem is going to be pretty small. Here's the same thing for a cubic spline. We'll plot that on top of it. Now, the spline is smooth, or smoother, and that creates this overshoot effect that we also saw a little bit in the interpolant. But everything is still between minus 1 and 1, so between 0 and 1 in absolute value, and therefore it's also going to be a very well-conditioned process. That makes sense, that's why these are popular things to do. Now if I compare that to a polynomial fit of the data, so we've done that sort of manually before, but MATLAB has a polynomial fitting function called polyfit, so if we use that to construct the Vandermann matrix and create the polynomial that interpolates the data everywhere, then you can see all the rest of the stuff now is squashed down because we changed the scale of the y-axis so much. And now we would think that the condition number of this method is going to be well over a thousand. That's another indication of why we probably don't want to use a global polynomial unless we have control and can choose very special node locations.